Welcome, my name is Will. I am one of the admission officers here at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. I'm joined by my colleagues, which will do a brief introduction uh, shortly, but I wanna make sure that we're able to orient ourselves to what's gonna be happening today. This is our very first application week and we are so excited about having the opportunity to really dive into some of the topics that we get a lot of questions about. In our information sessions, we typically do a high level overview and there's so much room for us to get into those weeds, help answer some of the questions you have and really unveil kind of some of that mystery that often surrounds the admissions process. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on testing, transcripts and academic history kind of broadly um, as those also sit under the umbrella of intellectual vitality. What does that all mean? I'll cover that in this introduction of what is the holistic review process. From there, we'll do our panelist introductions. And these are two panels that I'm so excited to spend time with today. We'll have a little bit of a moderated question and answer session, conversational um, in nature, and then we'll turn to your questions. So today, our goal is to help you better understand testing, transcripts, and academics within the kind of understanding of the admissions process here at the GSB. Our other goal, and it's maybe the goal I'm even more excited about, is being able to share tips, best practices, and things to consider to help you put your best foot forward when it comes to applying to business school, and hopefully here at the GSB. All right, so the holistic review process, what is it? It is something that might be a little bit of a foreign concept to some folks, like in fact, admissions is often a foreign concept to people, but the holistic review process is kind of the philosophy that we use as we're reviewing applications. Here's a definition that I really appreciate. Um, holistic as a philosophy is characterized by comprehension of the parts of something as intimately interconnected and explicable only by reference to the whole. For us, that means we are making our admissions decisions on the entirety of the pieces that you send to us. As we're thinking about that evaluation process, couple questions right off the bat that we often get. So we do not use a formula, an equation, or algorithm in any of our admissions decisions. Kind of in line with like, hey, what are there are any kind of structures or funneling systems that happen? There are no benchmarks no cutoffs and no quotas of any kind in our evaluation process either. We often get the question, I hear, or is it true that you only take, you know, X amount of people from my industry or X amount of people from my country? And that is not true. We are evaluating you as an individual within the greater context of where you're coming from, because you'll see like two lines down from here, context matters. And no one part of the application Ne matters necessarily more than any other. So today we are going to step away from the questions of here is my GPA, here is my testing, am I competitive or not? And really kind of shift the focus to think about, okay, so what is helpful for me to know about so that I can put my best foot forward? That's where we start talking about context. And I have a feeling we'll, we'll talk a lot about this year and different ways for you to let us know about, about the context of either your academic, intellectual, and or other achievements. So what are we looking for? So I gave you kind of that philosophical rundown, but we're looking for things in three buckets. First, intellectual vitality. This is the one where we're really gonna be talking about today, testing transcripts, academics, as, a marker, as some markers of potentially many of that intellectual vitality. Demonstrated leadership potential and personal qualities and contributions. Rather than go through all three right now, I highly encourage that you check out our uh, MBA admissions evaluation criteria webpage. There's a lot of really great information there and really accessible language. Rhetorical questions on intellectual vitality that can help you uncover what are some of the ways this might come to life for you. And in the case of demonstrated leadership potential, we actually outlined some of the different types of leadership competencies that you might be exhibiting in your everyday. Where do we find this? Throughout your whole application. I like to use this visual as a representation that each part of the application helps us understand one piece of who you are. 
it is almost like that analogy of the three wise men or three wise people who were touching different parts of the elephant and each one, because they couldn't see, someone was touching a foot, someone was touching the trunk, someone was touching the tail. They all had different interpretations of it. But once they were able to take their blindfolds off and see the entirety of what it was, there was so much more and a very different outcome than what, you might be, what they might've thought before. That's similar to the application process. We are taking a look at everything you submit to get a better sense of who you are, how you might show up in our classrooms and in our community. So with that preface, I'm gonna stop share so we'll be able to focus our attention on our conversation today. Um, and if we could start um, with Christine, we'll have you start and if you can introduce yourself and what is something meaningful for you about our line of work, about the <laughs> a profession of admissions? Sure, thanks, Will. Hi, everyone. My name is Christine, and I'm one of the admission officers here at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. And I've been working in MBA admissions for many years now. And I think one of the things that's so rewarding about the work that we do is that we are hopefully, uh, like we are today, spending some time educating and raising awareness about the opportunities in higher education uh, for everyone. So no matter what background you're coming from, what academic experiences or professional experiences you've had, helping to highlight what a graduate degree and a particularly an MBA degree can do for anyone because there are so many options once you're armed with this degree for what you can do. So I love getting to spend time one-on-one -on -one with applicants and, and admitted students and talking about what they wanna do next and how the MBA from Stanford might help them get there. And Allison, what quick introduction and what's something about this work that's meaningful for you? Hi everybody, I'm Allison. Happy to be with you this morning. Um, in the context of learning, I think what I love is not only when I'm reading each of your application, I feel like I'm opening a book on someone's life, but I also feel like I'm getting a window to the world because mm -hmm. through all of your essays and experiences from different industries and career stages and life experiences and all over the world, I just feel like I learned so much about the world um, through your, your personal journeys. Thanks. And for those of you, one more time, my name is Will. And one of the things that fuels me is being able to be a part of your educational journeys whether you end up applying and coming to Stanford, applying elsewhere or deciding to go on another life path. Like these are things that, how can I help you like realize and see what options are out there and choose what's best for you? Uh, I think that's something that keeps me going every day. So let's turn to the topic at hand. We are gonna be talking about testing transcripts, academics. And I would like to actually start um, with this idea of stats. There's a lot of tension and anxiety out there about, hey, this school's um, average GPA is this, this school's testing average is that. Can we unpack a little bit together? Like, what do those stats mean? How to interpret it? And like, should someone count themselves out of applying if they don't meet those numbers? So any like initial thoughts? Clearly, I have a lot of feelings about this. <laughs> Um, I, let me start. Um, I would just say there's such a over um, our, our potential applicants tend to obsess too much about the numbers and, you know, GMAT scores, GRE scores, your GPA. And please know that we don't look at any of you as a number. And um, not only are we forming a class of students, but we're also forming a community. So you are much, much more than, you know, whatever your GPA is or whatever your uh, GRE score is. And as Will referred earlier, there's no, no minimum scores. There's no target scores that we're looking for. And then, oh, go ahead, Christine. I was just going to build on Allison's uh, mention. I know so often as you're starting your research and you're learning about different schools, one of the first uh, places you visit will be that class profile for different programs. And I would just encourage you all not to anchor too much on what the averages or the medians might be there, because you must remember that's kind of just that middle ground. There are going to be students at both ends of that spectrum, and it's a pretty wide spectrum um, at most schools. So don't necessarily um, you know, count yourself out just because you may not be necessarily close to one number, because Allison said there are so many different uh, things to consider. And as Will mentioned, there are so many places we go looking for that intellectual vitality. And I guess the other thing to remember too is that class profile you're looking at, that's just one particular year. 
So they change from year to year because our students change from year to year. Yeah, that's true. And so maybe the natural extension of that question is, if we're not anchoring, so those numbers are a figment of who ends up getting admitted as opposed to targets that we're trying to reach. So that's like a very different philosophy. Um, so as we think about testing transcripts, like how do we use those in the evaluation process? Um, can you shed any light on, on that piece of it? Sure, Allison, I'll kick us off and maybe you'll, you'll add in if I've forgotten anything. So I think it's important to remember that when we're taking a look at your application, as Allison mentioned, we're, we're building this class, we're shaping a community here on campus, but that is all around uh, the idea of business school. As Will mentioned, uh, we are here focusing on your education and we ultimately want to make sure that students are joining us who will be able to thrive in the classroom. So one of the things that we are looking at with your transcripts and your test scores is your ability to handle some of the quantitative coursework that you'll be facing in an MBA program. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to come from a quantitative background. In fact, many of our students don't. So it's just a matter of where you may have had some exposure to those concepts in different places, whether it be in the classroom, through tests, or even in your workplace. So again, it's not only limited to your tests and transcripts at some point, but we do go there as a first place to start to get a sense of what quantitative exposure you've had so far. And I would just add to bring us back to the evaluation criteria and the one first one we'll mention was intellectual um, vitality. There's all sorts of ways to show that. And I think a lot of us know people that we've been in class with where maybe they had really high grades, but they didn't necessarily, you know, have intellectual curiosity. And I think the opposite is true. You know, we may see somebody with, um, uh, lower, you know, scores, but maybe they did original research as an undergraduate, which is pretty amazing, or maybe um, at work, you know, they wrote kind of a white paper that, that took some research and, and was beyond. So there, you know, when we talk about the holistic evaluation, we're diving deeper than just your, your you know, the, the scores and the numbers, and we're looking for examples of, of um, intellectual vitality. I'm actually going to jump into the Q&A box because there is a, qu a question here from Anjan from uh, Serbia and hope I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, but uh, they would like to know about the GMAT GRE kind of within that umbrella of intellectual vitality. And I think this would be a really great place to unpack intellectual vitality itself. Um, I like to think of it as like, what's your relationship with knowledge? Um, just the way Allison was talking about what are some of those things that kind of spark your curiosity. I kind of tried to slip in a little bit of a uh, kind of easy intro for all of you to start thinking about what are the things that incite, excite you in, in our introductions. Um, but Allison, Christine, any thoughts on kind of intellectual vitality overall and kind of what are those pieces that you already explained a little bit about markers that you might succeed in the classroom, but any thoughts on IV intellectual vitality um, broadly? I guess another example that comes to mind in terms of intellectual curiosity is you may have been someone who really sought out really hard classes in uh, in university and classes you know outside of your major and you didn't do particularly well in them but again there's the grade and then there's this pattern of seeing that you were often um, you know taking harder classes or, or ranging you know far from, from your major. And um, so again, I think for, for me, a lot of it is um, curiosity and the, um, uh, the uh, kind of energy to, to follow that curiosity, even if sometimes it, it's difficult. Yeah, and I would say sometimes it's not only just about the difficulty level of a class, but if you were a double major or you had a minor or two minors, uh, that was a way that during your undergraduate experience, you were ex expressing and exploring your intellectual curiosity. Uh, you know, sometimes that surfaced because you were just curious and you weren't sure what the right path might be. Uh, others were really clear and were very, you know, particular about which classes they chose to, to participate in. So those are all subtle things in the transcript that we're looking for. But I would also take, take us out of the transcript for a minute. One of the other places that that intellectual curiosity will surface for us is actually through your extracurricular activities. If you have hobbies or uh, different organizations that you might be involved 
involved with outside of work and outside of the classroom, uh, that can actually pop there too, because oftentimes you're drawn to different, uh, you know, activities because you have a particular interest or passion in it. So it does surface in many places. Ooh, you could also say that for, for work too, like what are some insights you might have had that have shaped the way a project or outcome has turned out? Um, it's this broad I concept of ideas, maybe. And what are the ideas that excite you? Knowing that some ideas are going to be explored in the classroom, and some might actually be more um, exciting and dynamic in that professional realm. So really thinking broadly about that. So love that. And I, we actually already started to go into transcripts. And as someone that I highly respect and invites like conversation like this, let's go there. Um, so um, let's talk about the transcripts. Allison, you started talking about GPA and looking beyond just that single number. GPA is a single data point that actually doesn't tell me much when I'm reading an application. The transcript itself as a whole is so much more interesting and has so much more data and information about you to it. Um, can we talk a little bit about how we look at kind of the coursework, trends, anything like that within the, um, the transcript itself? Right. Yeah. Um, well, we talked some about um, taking classes outside your major. I think uh, we do look at the rigor of your major. And so, you know, you may have been pre-med or, you know, electrical engineering major. And so, you know, the GPA may be lower, but uh, I guess what I'm saying is we look at the context of, uh, we look at your, your performance within the context. So maybe um, tough major, maybe you were the first person in your family to ever go to college. Um, maybe um, you, your family immigrated to the States. So your, your, your uh, English isn't your first language. So we really look at the broader context in terms of things that um, may have contributed or affected your, your performance. I'm actually going to expand that context even further because I know there's additional context that we also consider. Uh, and that is what was happening in your life outside of the classroom. So maybe you were on a varsity sports team and we know the, the time commitment that is required uh, if you're a member of a sports team. Uh, maybe you were working part-time or in some cases, maybe full-time while you were in school and that might've impacted the amount of time you were able to devote to your studies and your coursework. Uh, maybe you were working on campus, serving as a teaching assistant or a research assistant. So understanding the context within which that you were pursuing your education is also really important for us to understand. And I guess I, I wanna um, mention too that um, you know, why is any of this important in terms of your grades? I mean, as Christine mentioned, of course, we want you not to just to survive here, but thrive here. But it's not like um, we want these grades because we're, we um, are focused on your achievement. Um, a lot of the learning here at Stanford is from each other. So we care a lot about if you're the kind of person who um, loves ideas, is going to challenge each other and the professor inside the classroom, outside the classroom. So a lot of that has to do not just with, oh, we want you to you know, be a high achiever, but we want you to be an active contributor, not only to your own education, but to your classmates. Yeah, I think on that front, something that I think of a lot about is if I were in an applicant's shoes, if I was applying to business school, um, I know my academic history and I, you know, I could have prepared better. And so I think a lot about, or like I could, you know, college was a different time in my life. So I actually think a lot about, am I kind of, is that who I am? Or are there things that we can do or that someone out there can do um, to show that they have demonstrated or they have those abilities and can demonstrate it in like a classroom or learning environment. I think this might be the first time we've ever actually gone into um, tips best practices, things folks out there might can do um, to go out and um, kind of take ownership of their journey, for lack of better words. And I want to, before we go into this space, I do want to put out the disclaimer that we don't necessarily recommend that you do one thing versus another, but really take that step back to see, okay, what is realistic for, for me, given um, whatever's around me, resources, time, accessibility. Um, so, Again, this is not going to be a set of hard and fast rules, but rather things that we might have seen 
um, and maybe ways of thinking about it uh, that can help you even beyond just uh, the application process. So we've read a lot of applications. <laughs> what are some of the things that either we've seen or kind of could think about for folks who are who want to beef up that kind of academic preparedness? So in terms of that, Will, where I think you might be going here is if you're, say, coming from a social sciences background, you're an English major, a history major, uh, maybe you didn't really need to take too many math or science classes. And so you know we are going to be looking for your quantitative uh, exposure. You're not required to take pre-coursework before you join the MBA, but some people do find it helpful. So you may want to take advantage of all of those amazing online resources, local community colleges. There are a lot of ways to gain exposure to some of those concepts, um, but it is entirely up to you. Again, not a requirement uh, for our application process. You should check for other schools that might have them, but for us, it's really about just expanding your mind, getting comfortable with some of these concepts. And some of those uh, you know, do come with fees, but many of those can actually be accessed for free online now. So there is a way to kind of gain that exposure. And we have seen some people do it before they apply. Others don't do it before they apply, but they make the choice to actually gain some of that experience before they start the program. So in the summer leading up to school, sometimes they'll take advantage of some of those online resources or, or taking a class before they start the MBA. Yeah, so Christine, what happens if like I'm signed up for a class like that is after the decision uh, or after the application deadline, like how should I convey that? Should I convey it? Is that important? Absolutely, it's certainly worth mentioning. So when in doubt, whenever you feel like there might be some piece of your intellectual or academic journey or story that can't be clearly explained or expressed in the application, that is where the additional uh, information section will come in in your application, uh, which is not meant to be just a whole separate essay, but rather a place as a catch all really for anything that you just need to inform us about. So it could be a single bullet point or sentence that says, I've registered to take this class and I'll be starting it and it could be after the application deadline. Uh, this is also a place where if you had any struggles or challenges during undergrad, either an overall GPA or maybe just a particular class, if you feel like there's additional context that you need to explain to us uh, for where those grades might have come from, you can use that additional information section there. We've definitely seen that utilized for anyone who's explaining whether it was you know, an illness or an injury that may have prevented them from taking a test and that affected their final grade in a class that you can let us know there. There is a space so you don't leave us to our own devices to make up stories. You can tell us exactly what happened. And I would encourage folks to think about if you're gonna do any of this academic pre uh, preparation, uh, maybe it's just been a long time since you've had to do either intensive reading or writing, um, to think about preparing for the MBA itself. You know, work towards a, a goal that you'll be able to hit the ground running once you're at school, because that is gonna help you long-term as opposed to just taking a class for the sake of applying. Um, and I hope that mentality will set you up better for long-term success. Um, in terms of like what classes to think about, you actually know your kind of academic history the best. And this is where I would encourage you to take that kind of step back again and take control of, of the narrative. If you know there's an area that you might have struggled with in the past, that could be an area to think about uh, doing a little bit of additional work on. Um, we talk a lot about quantitative um, skills and the quantitative elements of the business school experience. Uh, but I would also encourage folks to practice reading, practice writing, communication and verbal skills are also going to be a huge part of the MBA experience. I know Allison was just talking about how do you challenge ideas um, and have constructive dialogue where there are differences of opinion, uh, because that's, that's where learning happens. Um, I think Dean Levin talks about um, learning happens when you embrace difference. And so how are we able to, to communicate that? So we covered a, a little bit about transcripts. So now can we, sh let's shift over to, to testing. Like there's a lot of questions and even it, in our Q&A box about, okay, the test score, you get one, one score, but there's also sub components. Can we talk a little bit about that and how that kind of factors in among the other parts of the application? 
I, I guess I'd start by just reminding people that just like everything in the application, we keep telling you that we look at it in context. Same thing with the test scores. Um, so for example, the verbal score, we're not going to expect as high a verbal score for um, a non-native speaker as a native English speaker, of course. Uh, with a quantitative score, um, if you were that history or English major, you may not, and you probably won't have as high a quant score as that physics or engineering major. So we look at, at, at uh, each piece in context um, and, um, and as Will said, you know, there, there, there's no, no minimum score. Um, but I should say with the English proficiency exams, there are hard minimums for obvious reasons. You need to be fluent in English before you get here, but with the GMAT, GRE, no minimum. Yeah, and remind me, Allison, those are actually set by the university as a whole, um, right. correct? For the English proficiency, right, yeah, yeah. But Will, since we're talking about tests, I'd love to remind everyone now that whether we're speaking about the GMAT, and GRE or the English language proficiency exams, uh, you all have options. So we accept both the GMAT and the GRE and there are no preferences between those two exams. So usually what I personally recommend and speaking just for myself, but before you sign up to take one of the tests, you can take free practice questions online with both tests. So you can get a sense and a feel for what each test is like. And if you find that you might be scoring better on one versus the other, maybe that's the test to consider. And that might be the one you want to take if you think that'll give you the opportunity to put your best foot forward there on a testing standpoint. And when it comes to the English language proficiencies, we accept three different tests, the TOEFL, the IELTS, and the Pearson Test of English. So yes, there are minimums for each of those that are set by Stanford University. But again, there are different tests and ways of asking you those questions. So you can be selective in terms of which tests you're choosing to take. And we have a very wide range of scores in the class. You will see um, you know, high average scores at Stanford. And it's not because we're aiming for a particular score that those averages tend to reflect our applicant pool in terms of who applies. Uh, but um, many times we've had people in the class uh, into the 500s, uh, and, um, and I can remember one particular case where we actually had someone in the class who got a 450 GMAT. Now, I'm not saying you should aim for a 450 GMAT, but the point was the person um, had you know, quite a low score, and they did perfectly fine. And so I think that also taught goes into our conversation about the subscores. One, one of them, again, is not necessarily more or less important than the other. And then we're looking across both your academic history as well as what are some of the things you're doing in your workplace? I think that is somewhere that folks don't often um, think about when we're thinking about that intellectual vitality and what are some of the skill sets and knowledge sets that are going to help set you up for success in business school. Um, and that's actually one of the questions here from Yuzra, uh, who's asking about those subsections. Um, and I can like, say that so I have seen instances where someone uh, did not have that many math courses in their um, academic background. Testing was fine. And in their workplace, they were doing a lot of uh, financial analysis, modeling. So it demonstrated, OK, yes, this individual does have that wherewithal to be able to thrive in different class settings um, and in different environments at business school. So thinking about it even holistically and very broadly beyond just here's that one section um, and what does that one thing tell us? Again, like no one piece is that like entry gate, but really we're looking at the entirety of your application to find things. Um, that's something too that your recommender might mention. They might talk about mm -hmm. Uh, you know, analytical projects you've done or um, uh, uh, projects that required a lot of um, reading and writing and, and uh, give us, you know, another data point about your quantitative and verbal skills. Okay, and because I, I mentioned the word holistic maybe a million times during this conversation, then the question here, there's actually a question here from Alex about how much time does, so, does an admission officer spend to holistically evaluate a candidate? Um, any thoughts? I have a thought, but I, I'm really curious to hear what you have to, what your responses are. Well, you'll notice that Christine and I both have rather thick <laughs> glasses and that's no accident over so many years of reading. <laughs> 
Absolutely. And I would say I, you probably saw me chuckle there when you were asking the question, because I think we all read at, at our own different personal paces. Uh, I know my, my, how much time it takes me to read might change depending on what time of day it is. So the most important thing for us is that we are reviewing every piece of that application. And some people might read a little faster, some might read a little slower. Uh, some people might read and then take longer to really think about you know, making any decisions. And so we're all kind of working at our own paces, but we're all on that same mission to make sure we're treating every applicant with full respect and reading every, every portion of that application before reaching any conclusions. Um, so the actual number would probably vary pretty widely depending on the day or uh, time of year even. Yeah, and I would, my, go ahead, go ahead, Allison. I was just gonna say for us, it's sort of like peeling back the onion. So for example, if we do see a low GPA, we're gonna be asking ourselves, you know, why is that? Is there any circumstances there? Is there any countervailing evidence like, you know, GMAT score, GRE score to, to uh, mitigate the GPA or, or uh, performance at work, so. And my half joking, half serious answer is, as long as it takes. Some applications are pretty clear cut. You're like, oh, here's someone, you know, evidence is here. It's clear there's shining recommendations. Okay, here's someone we might wanna consider. Those ones go quickly. There are also some, maybe the preparation is here. We, we're not seeing some of that demonstrated leadership potential, you know, so those might go quickly as well. And then the ones that take the longest are often the ones that have the pieces of contextual information or dots that we need to do a little bit more connecting so that like as Christine was saying like we are giving as fair and like like how can we best honor the, the entirety of this application to give a fair assessment and so it really does differ by individual you know by kind of environmental conditions and also by, by application so a couple of different factors there uh, but at the end, I actually really value and appreciate um, our reading system. And it's actually one of the things that kind of keeps me in this job is that we're able to do things holistically. Okay, so let's go into, we're actually gonna start leaning more into the Q&A box. I think there's some really great content here. Um, Christine, there, there was a question that I saw earlier about deferred candidates like they still have a chunk of their like senior year usually left to go. So for our deferred candidate and deferred admission, that is when you're applying in the final year of your bachelor's or um, a grad program if you've gone all the way through. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we view those transcripts knowing that there's gonna be a little bit, a chunk of them that's not gonna be full by, by the time they apply? Absolutely. Well, and again, we're going to use that word context again. It's about us understanding what you've done with the time you've had so far. So, you know, for students that have been working for five years, we'll have the full kind of past tense view of how you did in undergrad. With our deferred students who might be applying during their senior year, we'll see how you've done in your first three or three and a half years. So we'll get a sense of the, you know, how you performed in the classroom most recently. Uh, you'll be able to take the tests while you're still in that kind of study mode. Uh, while you're still a student. And so that will give us just kind of a, a moment in time understanding of how you performed in the classroom. So our expectation then is if that you're performing well now, hopefully you are preparing and will be performing well two to four years from now and you might be joining us in the MBA classroom. But it is just a piece and it is a moment in time. So like with all of our applications, these are just some of the data that we're considering when reviewing your entire application. And we will ask for that final transcript uh, for that last semester, uh, you know, in the summer before you come. So, um, you know, keep, keep, keep your grades up. And here's a tactical, practical question. So going into some of the logistics of it, and this question's from uh, Kanika. Um, are we open to considering the highest section scores from different sittings, or do we consider the overall, like a single sitting or the overall highest GMAT GRE? Good question. Uh, but officially, we will need you to report a single score. So from a single sitting. So you may have taken the test, say, two times, and you had a higher verbal on one and a higher quant on other. You can't mix them together. You'll have to pick one of those overall scores to report to us. Uh, in your application. And you'll be self-reporting in the application. I think I saw another question in that Q&A box that what if I take the test and the official scores may not be in in time for the deadline? That's okay because you're self-reporting on the application. It's okay if the official scores post 
right after or a little after that application deadline. But ultimately, you can only there's only space in the application to report uh, one full test score. Here's a question from Katerina, and I have to admit, I love this question. I love when we're able to unpack and demystify and really add information and meet to rumors that are out there. And so here's one who um, they've heard from previous students that the bar is much higher for international students. Are the expectations higher because we come from outside the US? Let's, let's discuss this one. Let's dig into this one. Yeah, we, we love uh, busting these myths and it, it, it makes our, our blood pressure go up when we hear some of these myths. Um, I would say that the only difference is that English proficiency exam uh, that you do need to be fluent in English before you get here. And so, yes, the, you know, I wouldn't say the bar is higher, but there is a, 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 a firm minimum on each of those three English proficiency tests and you do need to meet that minimum. Uh, and I, I don't know, Christine, that's the only difference I can think of. I would agree because otherwise when we're looking at the GMAT or GRE or the transcripts, we're looking at everything exactly as we, as we do for every application that we read. So looking for those same instances or examples of intellectual vitality and curiosity and the context of, in which we consider how people ended up with the grades that they did, you know, through all of the things Allison had mentioned earlier, the majors and um, other things that might've been happening outside. All of that, we look at every application in, with the same kind of perspective. So it really is just those minimums that again are set by Stanford. And the reason those minimums are there is because the, the coursework here is taught entirely in English. And again, we do wanna make sure that people will not only be just kind of getting by in the classroom, but being active participants in the experience. Yeah, and I would also say that we read a lot of international applications. So we also have a very good sense of what some of the different academic um, kind of systems are. Um, and also not everybody is graded on the same scale. And so sometimes when people are trying to translate or do correlations, I think there's a lot that gets lost in translation there. I know there was another question of prior in the Q&A box uh, that had to do like, what GPA do we report? Do we do a, there it is. Do we use it for each unique year or do we use the cumulative at the end of each year? So not all schools will do that. Report what you have. And I would say report it in the grading system and grading scale that you attended. We wanna see how you did in the context of your education. Um, and even within the American system, I could, there's like, I've seen 4.0 scales, I've seen 5.0 scales. I've seen there are schools that don't give us a grade, a letter or a number, but there's a full write up for every course they've taken. Those are fun to work through. Um, so we are very comfortable with a wide range of these systems. Um, but as both Allison and Christine were saying, like there is no different standard that we hold for our international candidates. Um, I think that con context piece does play come into play. Sometimes the language element, because maybe your first, second, and or maybe third or beyond languages were not English, you know, and that might pull down an overall GMAT score, or make things look different. So I would set that myth to rest. We are looking for the same criteria and the same types of talent, ability, and perspective, or a breadth of talent, skills, and perspectives, diversity within diversity from all of our applicants, no matter where they come from. All right, question. Continuing on the theme of international and uh, academics and other contexts, if our transcripts aren't in English, do we need to have them translated? Is it okay to translate them ourselves? How, how should someone approach that? Yes, it, uh, we, when you send the copies of the transcripts, uh, oftentimes we may see both. So we may see the official uh, in your original language and then a translated version. Um, because despite our best efforts, uh, we can't read all of the languages, uh, but it is sometimes helpful to, to see both. But um, some of you, uh, sometimes people will use different services to do the translations. Um, so there, there's some flexibility when you're applying because we're looking for copies of your transcripts at this time. Um, but if admitted, we will need to see the official transcripts and we will need an official translated copy at that time. Great. 
Thank you. And kind of, and so you just mentioned can apply with an unofficial transcript. We'll request an official one later. I know sometimes that has been um, a topic of conversation. We understand that sometimes requesting transcripts costs additional money. If you're applying to many business schools, that might increase the cost. So we're really trying to be as sensitive as possible um, throughout this process. Also knowing that sometimes it's just really difficult to get official transcripts, especially if maybe you haven't attended school for a long time, there can be a lot of different hoops you have to um, jump through. So we're trying our best to uh, ease that process wherever we can. Okay, and here's, here's another question. And I think it tailors nicely with this question of, maybe I'm still doing some preparation. Maybe there's things that I'm still doing. When should someone apply, right? Do, like, at what point should we be thinking about, I need to have everything in my application? Or what are things that it's okay to update later on? When does that make sense? How should I be thinking about kind of the two possibilities out there? Yeah. I mean, of course, obviously, there's when you want to start school, which is probably the first cut. Uh, but then it's really when can you present the strongest application? Um, and, um, you know, when you update things later, uh, after the deadline, they will become part of your file, but we can't promise that they'll be considered. We may have already read your application. So I would say, you know, if you're waiting for something really important, like, uh, well, in fact, you know, with the GMAT, if you're going to retest, retake it or the GRE score, that does need to be taken before the deadline. So um, I would say, you know, minor things could be updated, but if it's something really important to the strength of your application, you'd want to do it before you apply. Great. Thank you. And here, I, let's round into this question again. Um, kind of, we've approached it from different perspectives, but I don't think we've actually named it. So the question is, from someone who does not necessarily have the broadest quant background and maybe some of the obvious places, uh, but how can they communicate quantitative abilities? Do they always need to, or like in what spaces does it make sense? Yeah, I think Allison um, talked about this a little bit earlier on in that, again, if it doesn't naturally or obviously present in say your test score or in your academic uh, background and experience, uh, the workplace is, is oftentimes where this will surface. And in some cases, it might present because you've told us in your resume, maybe, you know, one of the line items under one of your, your particular roles or in, uh, your time at a particular company, you're able to highlight a time when you were working uh, on something analytical. But another place where that surfaces a lot for us is through the letters of, of reference that we receive. So your recommenders may be able to share stories with us about how you were able to display some of those quantitative or analytical skills through a different project uh, that you might've been working on uh, at, uh, in the company. So there's a lot of different places. And again, even sometimes in your extracurricular activities. So um, you may not be giving yourself enough credit. You may be a part of a community organization and you had to organize a big drive and it turns out that you actually had to keep things really organized and you were actually using more of those kind of muscles than you may have even realized. So there may be an opportunity to share some of those stories within your application as well. Yeah, maybe you're sharing some of that in one of your written responses. Maybe it's an optional response, maybe just a bullet point or two in your additional information if it doesn't come up naturally somewhere else. So we really provide a lot of landscape for you to use in a way that makes sense for you. Um, so hopefully, if you take that, if you're thinking about it and you're like, yes, I do have these, but it doesn't come out obviously my application, let us know in one of these other spaces. Um, I, I'll take one more, uh, one more question that I really want to ask our group. I, I have come across, I've had a lot of conversations about folks who might not have had uh, the most stellar kind of initial undergraduate career and then redid or had these other um, journeys and pathways that show that they have these talents. So as we close out uh, this the session, kind of, can we crystallize in just a few words, like, how can you demonstrate like this intellectual vitality across a broad range, like any thoughts, words of wisdom, words of encouragement that you have for folks out there who might still be hesitating because, you know, of a past that they have? I guess mine are just 
a little, a few reminders that you do have that additional information section if you do want to explain some extenuating circumstances. And also that we look at, um, you know, we look at the whole journey. So you may have started out uh, with a weaker GPA at the beginning of university and then it got stronger, um, or you may have done some graduate work um, uh, that that uh, you know showed stronger performance, um, and that um, again, you know, we look at other sources like your workplace, your extracurriculars. You know, maybe you were at a robotics club, and my goodness, you're doing a lot of you know quantitative stuff. I'll I'll just kind of add on top of what Allison mentioned, um, remembering that your academic experience, uh, undergrad or graduate, if you've had any, again, it's a, it's a moment in time in, in your very long life and journey. And so if you didn't perform as well in undergrad for whatever reasons that might've been, uh, knowing that you'll still have an opportunity to demonstrate some of that intellectual vitality through the, the testing process, uh, that could be an opportunity for you to make sure you're spending enough time studying and preparing so you have an opportunity to show what we may not have been able to see earlier. Uh, if you're one of those folks out there who worry about testing, that's not your strong suit. I understand. I hear you. Uh, and just know that if you are coming in maybe with a lower GMAT or GRE and lower grades, uh, again, that additional information up as a section where you can share some of that context, the rest of the story to fill in those pieces for us. And again, just know that we are looking at everything else that you've done in your life beyond those two things uh, to try to get, an, get an, a full understanding of who you are and what you have to contribute to this community. And I love how we've kind of zoomed out through this process to really think high level. My words of encouragement are you are so much more than two numbers in an application. There is the journey. As part of that journey is that learning and growth that you have have earned over your time. You know, if you're thinking about business school, who are you now because of those uh, ex experiences? What are some of the skill sets that you now have so that you can thrive when you are in a, a, a moment of challenge again? What are some of the things that do spark your excitement to learn, grow, and in turn share that knowledge with others? I think as we kind of step back and really think about the wholeness of who you are, the academic piece is just one part of the story. And I really encourage you, if you aren't already, check out our Sharing Your Story um, workshop series, where we'll be able to unpack even more about how you can think about these elements and moments in your life such that you can really put your best foot forward, whether it's in a written format in the application, an interview, networking, or any other place where people are trying to learn more about you and you're building relationships um, kind of to move your career and life forward. With that, if you haven't done so, I encourage, I also encourage you, I'm doing a lot of encouraging today, apparently. I encourage you to start at my stanford.mba account. We can, um, with a couple of questions, we'll can help you create a dashboard that'll consolidate events of interest to you. There's also an application um, tracker that'll help you keep track of where you are in the process to make sure you're headed uh, in the right way for that round one, round two, or round three deadline. With that, thank you so much for joining us today. Hopefully we were able to share some uh, good information, things that help you better understand how we use testing transcripts and your overall academic history to better understand who you are in this application process. Hopefully I'll see you around throughout the rest of this week or at other Stanford events. Until then, take care and stay safe.